Good morning. It is so good to be with you today. My family and I have been looking forward to this moment. A lot of prayer has gone into getting us to this point today. And I can tell you now, there's just a lot of excitement about this. We are so thankful and, and humbled uh, by the opportunity. Uh, it's a privilege to, to get to be here. And I can tell you, as we've gotten to know First Baptist Bernie just a little bit, as we've met with, with the discipleship pastor search team and have gotten the chance to meet with pastor Jason and the staff, our excitement has really just grown. Um, and I can, can I just tell you something that really was kind of a, a point for me when I, when I learned something, when I heard something for the first time, it was one of those moments where, where the Lord just really began to speak to my heart and say, Daniel, this is this is a special place, and this is a place where, uh, where, where, where I'm, I'm, I'm working, and it really made me lean into uh, really discovering more about this uh, role of discipleship pastor. And so it's the statement that Pastor Jason said this morning as we began, and I just want to say it again because it's so good, that First Baptist Church Bernie is a gospel-centered, multi-generational church family who highly values growth groups and living our lives on mission for Jesus Christ. I love that statement and I'll tell you why. I love it because it tells me who you desire to be. You desire to be a community of believers, a body of believers here that are on mission for Jesus Christ and you know that that is centered and found in the gospel. I love that, that it tells me that about who you are and it tells me about what you value. You value community, you value relationships, you value growing in your faith so that you can be used by God to impact the world around you for Jesus Christ. That, that is an incredible incredible thing. And, and the reason that's so incredible is because that is, that is the heart of scripture. That's the heart of the gospels. We don't have to look any further than Jesus's last words on earth before his ascension, when he was speaking to his disciples in Matthew chapter 28. We know this is the great commission. If you've been in church, you've, you've said this, you may have this memorized, but what did Jesus say to them before he, before he ascended to heaven? He said, all authority has been given to me on he in heaven and on earth. He said, so, so then go therefore, and what? Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And he said, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. We are called as the body of Christ as the church, as local churches all across this world, we're called to do one thing, and that is to make disciples. So what is a disciple? If, you, if we polled everybody in this room and we talked about that, we might hear different things. People might say a disciple, well, that is a learner. That is someone who has received knowledge about, about someone or about something. A disciple is a learner. They, they know a lot of information. Or a disciple is, is a student. But here's, if we just boil it down, a disciple is a follower. A disciple is a follower because it goes beyond just knowledge. A disciple is consumed. Their identity is consumed by the one they are following. And that identity that is consumed and changed because of who they are following, their actions are impacted and their actions are consumed. So as disciples of Jesus Christ, when Jesus calls us to be disciples and to make disciples, here's what I want us to understand. It is all about putting our identity and who we are because of the gospel into action. A disciple is all about identity but it doesn't stop with just knowing who we are. It's got to then go to, to impacting how we act in our world. And so that's what I want us to look at today. And I want us to do so by looking at a passage of scripture in the book of Hebrews. So if you brought your Bible with you, go ahead and open it to Hebrews chapter 10. We're gonna be in verses 19 through 25 for just a few minutes this morning. And I love this passage because the writer of Hebrews 
is going to bring into focus for us and help us understand how we can put our identity into action. And what we're gonna learn as we see that is that that's kind of our blueprint. That is our guide for how we're to make disciples in the local church is by what we're gonna see here as the writer of Hebrews shares with us just some powerful words. So I'm gonna read the entire passage and then we're gonna break it down for just a few minutes. So follow along with me. It says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, he says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. May God just take his word this morning and just speak deeply into our hearts with it and may we be changed by it. Amen. So I want you to see something right as we begin in verse 19. I want you to look at an important word that this section begins with, and it's the word therefore. Why is that there? Well, the writer is calling us to look back at everything that he has been saying up until this point, because it is significant to everything he is going to say moving forward. And so we don't have time to dig into all of that this morning, but here's what you need to know. The case that the writer has been making, writing to his audience, which is primarily made up of Jewish believers, it was this, Jesus is better. That's the theme of the entire book of Hebrews, is that Jesus is better. He's better than the law. He's he's better than the angels. He's the better sacrifice. He's the better high priest. Jesus is better. He is superior. And that has been what he's been laying out for those who were reading this letter in the first century. And so now he gets to this point and he says, so therefore, or because Jesus is better. And then he's going to go into the rest of this. So don't miss that. And then he goes ahead and he gives us two things that are going to help us understand what the commands or the imperatives that he's going to give us as we go along in this section, he's going to tell us two things. There's two things that we need to know about our identity in Christ if we are going to be able then to live out our identity in a way that glorifies God and impacts the world around us. And those two statements start with the word since. So let's just quickly look at both of those for just a minute. He says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. So the first sense, he's saying, listen, you need to know something about your identity as a follower or as a disciple of Jesus. You need to understand that you have access to God. You see, the Jewish people would have, would have understood all before Jesus came, their access was limited. They had to depend upon sacrifices that they would bring to the temple and they would have to depend upon a priest who would go before God on their behalf. And he says, listen, that is all changed. Your identity is now found in Jesus. This passage here where he says, since we have confidence to enter, the focus isn't on our entering. The focus is on why we are now able to enter. And it is all because of the blood of Jesus. Church, that's good news. We don't come before God with any righteousness or good works of our own. We don't come to God with hesitancy, wondering, have I been good enough? Is God pleased with me? You know, it, it, you know is, is, is today a good day? No, he says, listen, your confidence, your identity is rooted in the blood of Jesus that was shed for you. 
And he says, it is a new way. You no longer have to depend upon the sacrifices of, of bulls and goats and, and lambs. He says, it, that, that's gone. He says, it's now the perfect blood of Jesus because he's the superior sacrifice. He says, it's a living way. You know, this speaks to his resurrection of his life, right? The gospel, we have hope in the gospel of Jesus, not just because of his death on the cross, but because he came out of that tomb three days later, amen? That's where our hope is found. He is alive. And because he is alive, we have life, right? The Bible says if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. We have a life. It's a living way. And then he says that way is through the curtain of his flesh. It's a picture to look back at the temple worship and how when Jesus died on the cross and he said it is finished, that veil was torn in two from top to bottom, meaning that that veil of separation was gone. And we now can come before God as his children. Because Jesus' blood has been shed for us to make us stand in the right position before the Father. Isn't that good news? And he says, since that is true of you, that is now, it, you can't, if you are a follower of Jesus, whether you came here to end today feeling like you were a new creation, or whether you came in here today confident of your position before God, that really doesn't matter. What matters is what God's word says about you. And he says, that is what is true of you. You have confidence because of his blood. And then he says, and since we now have a great priest over the house of God. This is looking back again earlier in the book where he says, Jesus is the better, the superior high priest. Who was the priest in the Old Testament? He was the advocate before the people. He was the one that would go to God on behalf of the nation and offer sacrifices to atone for their sin. And he says, listen, since we have a great priest over the house of God, that is Jesus. Jesus is our advocate before the father. He's the one at the right hand of the father seated there who says, my blood paid for them. My blood was shed for them. They have access to you, Father, because of my blood that was shed. They're forgiven. They're made right. We have an advocate right now before the Father in Jesus Christ, who is on our behalf saying, we are new creations. We are made new in Jesus. And also, don't miss that last statement over the house of God. Write this down if you're taking notes or make a little mark in your Bible to go back and look at Hebrews chapter three, verse six, because that tells us the writer of Hebrews says, I'm going to turn to it just quickly and read it for you. He says, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son and we are his house. If indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. Do you see the picture here about our identity? Not only have we been cleansed and made right because of the blood of Jesus, but check this out, church. You as a follower, as a disciple of Jesus, you are now the residence of the spirit of God. We are the house of God. This great high priest, Jesus, takes up residence in you and I. That ought to just completely just blow our minds to understand what our identity is in Jesus as a follower and as a disciple of him. So with that in mind, with that understanding in place, because without that proper understanding of our identity, there is no way that in verses 22 through 24, the imperatives that the writer gives us, we're not gonna be able to live those out without understanding and having a grasp of who we are. So with the understanding of who we are, let's look at what the writer calls us to do as the body of Christ. So look at verse 22. He says, because of everything we've looked at, verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. 
There's four statements here that talk about how we are to draw near because we now have access, right? Because that veil has been torn because Jesus now gives us access and there is intimacy that we can have as children of God. He says, as we draw near, here is how we are to draw near. Look at, look at the four statements. The first two are very subjective. They deal with our attitude in drawing near. Look at the first one. He says to draw near What? With a sincere heart. What does that mean? It means a true heart. It means a heart without divided loyalties. It means that nothing else is in that place of prominence other than Jesus Christ. He says, we draw near with a heart that is longing for Jesus Christ and intimacy with him. It means no hypocrisy. It means we're not saying one thing and doing another, but that when we draw near, we are drawing near, understanding that without Jesus, we are nothing, but knowing that what we need more than anything is his presence and his power working in our life on a daily basis. So he says, draw near with a sincere heart. He says, draw near what? With full assurance of faith. Now, he's going to develop this idea about faith in chapter 11, where, where the writer gives just the great hall of faith and all those who have gone before, who have demonstrated faith in God and his, and his promise. But, but what do we need to know? This full assurance of faith has everything to do with the person and work of Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, faith is only as good as the object that you're placing it in. Right? So if we're putting our faith in our culture, if we're putting our faith in, in our government, if we even put our faith in one another, in, in relationships or in a job, our faith is on shaky ground because none of those things will last. None of those things can satisfy. But when we put our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, we can have full assurance that he is enough that he is all that we need and that following him, he is going to lead us and guide us and direct us. And that's what he's saying. He says, draw near with that attitude that your confidence is in nothing but Jesus Christ and his work on your behalf. He says, that's how we are to draw near. That's the attitude we should have in drawing near. But then he says there's two other things that we should be mindful of as we draw near. And these are very objective because these are things that God has done. These are not things that we even have the ability to do. It's all about what he has done. And it's a past action with ongoing results. That's the language that's used here. And what are those two things that God has done? He says, draw near, being reminded that your hearts have been sprinkled clean. Now, we don't have to go, we don't have time to go into all of the the, the picture of this from the Old Testament, but let me give you a couple of passages of scripture that you could look at later if you want to. Exodus chapter 29. Numbers chapter 19. In Hebrews, he actually talks about this in chapter nine as well, in verses 13 and 14. This idea of having our hearts sprinkled clean, it's a picture of the priests before they would go in to to do the work of a priest in the Old Testament. They, They would have blood sprinkled upon them. And it was this idea of them being consecrated to be worthy to do the, the job that they were called to do. It was also a picture in the Old Testament. There was this ritual of a red heifer where if you had come in contact with anything dead, with a dead body, you were unclean. And so you would have the blood of a red heifer sprinkled on you so that you would not be defiled by death. Do you see the picture here? He's saying, draw near with the understanding that we were dead in our sins and trespasses. We were not worthy because of our nature to stand before a holy God and serve him. But our hearts have been sprinkled clean by the blood of Jesus if we have had it applied to our life by surrendering to him and trusting him as our Lord and Savior. He says that is how we should draw near. And he says we should draw near with our bodies washed. 
Now, what's this a picture of? Well, our minds immediately probably go to baptism, right? And that picture of identification, that picture of here's who we were before Jesus and that old man is buried and now we have new life. We are raised to walk in new life. And that is exactly the picture. We are washed. It's an idea of purity. It's an idea that not only are we justified in Christ, we are made right, but we are being as disciples, as followers of Jesus, we're being sanctified. We, in our everyday life, we are learning. God's spirit is working in us to help us live more like who we really are in Christ. So that's the picture is that as we draw near, we are drawing near with the understanding, am I living more like Jesus? Am I being purified? Am I being sanctified? Is what is true of me being lived out in me? He says, that is how we're to draw near. But look at verse 23. There's another command he gives us. He says, let us hold fast to our, the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. What are we to do? We're to hold fast. Right, but what are we to hold on to? That's really important, right? Just like when we said we are to draw near with full assurance of faith and that faith is in Christ, if we're to hold fast, what is the object that we're to hold to? He says we're to hold fast to what? The confession of our hope. What's he talking about? He's talking about that confession of Christ, that surrender of our life to Jesus. When we come to Jesus for salvation, what are we confessing? What are we saying? We're saying that I am not enough. We're saying that I am lost. We're saying that, that, that I am saying that I am dead spiritually, that I am cut off from a right relationship with God. But when I come to Jesus, I am saying, Jesus, you are enough. You are enough to rescue me. You are enough to sanctify me, to, to make me righteous, to clothe me in your righteousness and to reconcile me to my creator, to my father. So what are we holding fast to? We're holding fast to what Jesus has done for us. We're holding fast to the confession of our faith. But what does he say here? How are we to hold fast? Without wavering. Now, if we're honest today, are there times in our walk with Jesus where we waver? Do we have times where where through circumstances and situations in life, it gets a little dicey. But he says we should hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. How can we do this? With the understanding that he who promised is faithful. Amen. Church, even if you came in here today with questions and doubts, all you need to do is look at the cross and look at the empty tomb and be reminded of the faithfulness of God to do everything that you need, to give you everything that you need so that you can be right with him. Then he goes on, verse 24. He says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. That first word, let us consider the word means to bear our minds down on something with focused attention. It implies that you've got to give thought to it or it's probably not going to happen. And if we're considering how to stir one another up, it means we've got to take our attention off of ourselves and look at others. It's an important word for us to consider, right? <laughs> to bear down, to give this focused attention. And what does he want us to consider? How to stir up one another. Now this word, we would use it in a negative way most of the time because the word really means to provoke, okay? It kind of means, it's, it's got a negative connotation. We, he's saying, I want you to stir one another up. Consider how you can stir one another up. Now, something I could tell you a lot of stories about later, um, I'm the oldest of eight kids. Six of those are girls. And so as the oldest and as the oldest boy, 
The next closest sibling to me was seven years younger than me. And so can I tell you what I did in her early years of life and even really still to this day? I fulfill these words. I consider how to stir her up as often as I can. I give a lot of thought to how I can just keep her in turmoil and I get great delight in doing it. It's, it's part of my sin nature that God is dealing with me and I need, I need to continue to deal with it. But that is the idea. It is to never let it get off your mind about how to stir someone up, how to agitate them. But, but look at how he flips it from a negative convert, connotation. He said, stir one another up to love and good deeds. He says, as believers, you know, the first two, they're very personal, right? Let us consider how to draw near. Let us consider holding fast, right? Let us draw near. Let us hold fast. But this third one, let us consider. Now we're looking out. He says, let us consider how to do this for one another. The order of the words are important. It starts with something internal. Let us consider how to stir one another up to love the way Christ would have us love. And as an overflow of loving the way he would have us love, then to stir us up to do good deeds. Which reminds us, we're never going to, we're never going to live like Christ if we're not striving to love like Christ. Right? Our deeds are never going to reflect Jesus if our hearts have not been transformed and we're not learning how to love him and love others the way he loves them. Now, verse 25 is application. And this is where I want to take the few minutes we have remaining. And I want us to focus in on this together. Because 25 is not another command. Verse 25 tells us how to live out what he's already told us to do not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. You've probably heard that passage and you've probably heard that passage used talking about a gathering like this where we gather together for worship and you've probably been admonished to, to not forsake this, to make this a habit, and that would be a right application to gather together as the body. But check this out. You guys have been in the book of Ephesians and you've been learning how as we are a living body of believers and we've been learning in the book of Ephesians, I've been following along with you online and we've been learning how we do that. How do we live like that body? So here's something we need to understand. Not neglecting to meet has so much more to do than just this hour on Sunday morning. This is every time we meet, every time we gather. What are we to do? We are to, we are to stir one another up to consider how we can encourage one another to live for Jesus, to be disciples. That's what he's talking about here. And he's, and he's saying this. Did you catch it in all three statements? Let us draw near, let us hold fast, and let us consider. You know what that screams to me? It's the job of the whole body. It's not just the job of the pastor or of the growth group leader, but as a body of believers who have the spirit of God indwelling you, it is all of our jobs to be discipling one another, to be pouring into one another because we all need it. It also tells me that to accomplish what he's told us to do, we've got to know each other on deeper levels than just superficial. So just coming in here and sitting down and listening and, and participating, singing and worship or hearing the word of God, that's not gonna cut it. If we're gonna consider how to stir one another up to love and good deeds, that means we've gotta know one another. That means we've gotta be living in community with each other so that we can encourage and, and, and hold each other accountable and, and spur one another on to live more like Jesus. It tells me it's gonna take intentionality. Being a disciple, making disciples, living out these imperatives that we see in Hebrews, they're not gonna happen by accident. You see, our identity in Christ, we've gotta constantly be reminding ourselves of it if it is going to change our actions. 
And we can't just remind ourselves of it because it's so easy to lie to ourselves. Isn't it? Isn't it so easy to fool yourself to say, oh, I'll get to that later. Oh, things aren't so bad. Oh, I, I know this habit isn't good, but it's, it's not that bad. And, and it's just, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll set it aside eventually. Yeah, I know I haven't been working on my marriage, but, but I'll get to that eventually. Right now, this is a bigger priority, right? We can fool ourselves. We can make excuses. But when we're living in community, we have the body of believers around us to encourage us, to hold us accountable so that we aren't neglecting the things of God in our everyday lives. And this verse also gives us another important reason to do the things that we've seen this morning. What does he say? And do these things all the more as you see the day drawing near. There's a sense of urgency, is there not? As we think Jesus is coming back and there's going to be that day where every knee will bow and tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. And I've got people who live around me who don't know Jesus. And so I need to be serious about my walk so that I can, can I, so that I can show Jesus to those around me. And I need to be serious that I'm not wasting the time that he's given me. And I need to be living out who I am in Christ because I understand my time here is short and eternity is soon, eternity with him. So we've got to have that sense of urgency. But here's what I want us to think about this morning as we close. How, how would God have us apply this passage as I've read it this week and over the last few weeks, just asking, God, show me how to apply this to my life. What are you trying to show me about your call on us as your people to make disciples, to be a disciple? There's a few things I want us to understand that we need each other. If we as First Baptist Church Bernie are really going to be a gospel-centered, multi-generational church family, it's only possible when we see everything through this lens of discipleship and how the writer of Hebrews tells us we should be living out our faith. So let me ask you, who's pouring into you? Who's helping you make sure that you are drawing near to God, that you are holding fast to the hope? Who, who, is, who is pouring into you to make sure that you are living out your faith and love and good deeds? And then as a follow-up question, who are you pouring into helping them do the same thing? Because that's what it means to be a disciple, to be a follower of Jesus. So, so who's doing that for you? Because see, discipleship, it's got to permeate all of our structures. Everything we do as the local church, we've got to see it and do it through this lens of are we discipling one another? Are we helping one another draw close to Jesus but not only does it have to permeate our structures, it's gotta happen organically. And I think the more it permeates what we do as a church body, the more it's going to happen organically. The more we are embracing living life together in gospel-centered community, the more we are gonna see opportunities to pour into one another. Empty nesters, are going to organically begin to see young moms and dads and say, I've got time on my hands. How can I pour into them? We're gonna see senior adults who have retired who say, I've got time on my hands. How can I use this time to impact the kingdom of God? Who could I mentor? Who could I take one-on-one -on -one and help teach the word of God to? Our children, we can learn as adults from children and their hearts that are tender and that childlike faith, we can pour into one another, but we can only do it when we're embracing this gospel-centered community because discipleship can never be separated from that. We can't make disciples or be disciples in isolation. It's only when we gather. It's only when we embrace and commit to doing life together. And that's hard because sometimes it gets messy. When I know I'm not walking with Jesus, the last thing I want is somebody else in my business. But that's the very thing I need. And that's why we've gotta have it. 
Discipleship has to equip those being discipled to know what they believe, why they believe it, and then to help them get connected to living, to doing ministry, to serving. There's no category of professional Christian. We don't hire people to do the work of ministry in the local church. It's all of our jobs to be equipping and supporting and, and, and proclaiming the name of Jesus. Discipleship has to break through silos. Silos of age and race, politics, socioeconomic backgrounds, or any other man-made categories that we tend to put on ourselves as people. Discipleship has got to break through those and we've got to build bridges to connect with people that we might not naturally connect with, but we do it because the gospel demands we do it because the gospel says our identity has to, we have to understand it so that it changes our actions. And when we do, we start to build bridges and we start to get into each other's lives. And what ends up happening as a result of that? As we close, I want you to look at Romans 15 verse five and six, and I know our worship team is gonna come, and I just want this to be our prayer this morning. I read this passage this week, and I thought, God, would you make this so, a First Baptist Church, Bernie, as your people? He says, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together, you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God, this morning, God, would your spirit take your word and penetrate deep into our hearts with it? God, would you help us, God, in a new and fresh way to understand our identity in you? as disciples of Jesus Christ. And God, may it transform our actions. God, may it cause us to draw near to you in deeper ways. God, may it cause us to hold fast to you, confessing you as Lord. And God, may it cause us to consider how we do life together in the body of Christ, how we are being discipled and making disciples. God, so that you are Glorify God so that we could live in harmony and with one voice glorify you. Lord Jesus, we know you're returning soon. So God, may we be found faithful and may we be found living out the mission that you gave us to go to make disciples, 